Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another episode in the Toxic series. Today we're going to be covering a paper from Springer Nature called uh, Springer Nature Applied Sciences. Now this is a journal I'd never heard of before. I looked up its impact factor and it has an impact factor of one. This was brought to us by a member in the Discord community, and we're going to look at this. Okay, so today we're talking about a steroid oxazole derivative, which has an unnecessary bracket here and they look at its activity with the kinase protein. Now, whenever we talk about any of the bio stuff, I'm just gonna gloss over it as this isn't my area of expertise, although there are some things that I'm gonna talk about as we go through this. So in the previous paper, we have like talked through the whole paper, like in the banana water one, but we're not gonna do that today. We're just gonna read a few sentences here and there and just kind of criticize this a little bit. So let's start with the introduction. There are several studies which indicate that mitocardial in infarcation infarction is a major cause of health worldwide so this is a real thing infarction however it's a cause of health worldwide that's okay there's health worldwide as a consequence of it um, they have several claims throughout this paper which are somewhat concerning such as the use of the phrase some drugs so here it says several studies have been carried out using some drugs such as benzimidazole some other drugs here all these data suggest that some drugs can inhibit the effect of CK2. However, the interaction of some drugs with CK2 is very confusing. Perhaps this phenomenon could be due to one, differences in the chemical structure of each drug, or two, different methods used in each experiment. This sounds like it was written by someone who has no idea what they're talking about. Therefore, the aim of this study was to synthesize a steroid oxazole derivative to evaluate their biological activity against isochemia, reperfusion injury, and compare with quinalizarin, a CK2 inhibitor inhibitor. So if you have an inhibitor that needs inhibiting, you can use this compound. Okay, so we're going to have to bounce back and forward a little bit throughout this because they kind of list stuff in an interesting order. So in their experimental, they say that they use CDCL3 as their deuterated solvent, and they also say that they use TMS as an internal standard. Now, in some papers, you'll see that chemical shifts are reported with reference to TMS, and that doesn't mean you need to have TMS in there. However, here they say that they have TMS as an internal standard. And so not in none of these spectra do they have TMS. So why don't we just jump forward for a second, look at the three spectra in this paper. Okay, so in this first spectrum, you can see that there's no peak at zero ppm. And in fact, it isn't just zero ppm, you can see it's minus zero ppm. So TMS has a signal at zero ppm, which is how we calibrate, you know, NMR. There's no uh, TMS in their second one here, and there's no TMS in their third one. Okay, so that's concerning. So that's a bit nonsense. They also say that they do gas chromatography. And so on these steroid derivatives, you may not know much about steroids, but they do not have much vapor pressure. Now, you could get probably cholesterol to go in GCMS, but not something this complicated. You know, if, if you think otherwise, please comment down below, and you're welcome to argue with me in the Discord if you think you could do a GC on a steroid derivative that looks like this. And I'd be happy to be proven wrong if, if you believe that it, it can't be done. Okay, so they have the name of the compound here, and they say they start with 200 milligrams, okay? They literally, for this reaction, say that they just reflux this with acetonitrile. Why don't we just jump down to look at the scheme that they say they do. So here you can see they have estradiol. They have a phenol here as well as a secondary alcohol. They say that they reflux it with acetonitrile. They get this acetamide derivative, except if you look at this, this isn't how you normally draw an amide if you know anything about amides. And they also somehow lose a CH and added this weird four-membered ring. Now I looked up this motif in the literature and this motif does not exist. This is not a reported motif. There's no reaction that you can add acetonitrile in via a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition to a ketone. Additionally, they don't give you any indication of stereochemistry. You don't know whether the oxygen's up or the nitrogen's up, and they don't make any comments about mixtures of uh, one enantiomer uh, or two disteromers, rather, because there's this methyl group. So they don't give any comment about that. So then the thing that they do next is they use acetic anhydride and nitric uh, acid to put a nitro group in the ortho position. And then they say that they substitute the nitro group uh, just with the carbonyl of this amide. Okay, so the other thing that's kind of weird here is they don't draw this like a typical oxazole. They kind of draw this weird structure. But, you know, it, it looks fine. It's just kind of derpy. Okay, so unreported motif. They don't hype that up at all. You know, if they've 
created a new four-membered ring, you think that that would be like, you know, a much bigger paper than some publication in an Impact One journal, but nonetheless, they report it. Okay, so here you can see that they start with 200 milligrams and they get their product in 44% yield. Literally, all they do is reflux their stuff in acetonitrile, okay, and then they get their NMR in chloroform. And so they say that the proton NMR is at 300 megahertz. That's what they'd said earlier. But here they report the carbon NMR at 300 megahertz, which is actually incorrect. The correct uh, megahertz of the NMR should be uh, 75. But in this case, they don't give it to you in megahertz even. They give it to you in hertz. Okay, it does hurt. It hurts me, that's for sure. So next they take their product, which is also suddenly 200 milligrams. Well, given that their mass of the product shouldn't have changed too much from the starting material, it's surprising that they get a nice clean 200 milligrams that they use in the next step. Here, they also don't give you a number of milligrams, just 44%. Now, I didn't go and calculate this because, you know, my simple brain can look at 200 milligrams, times it by 0.5, and assume that I'd get about 100 milligrams. And unless they've got some really, really heavy atoms in their acetonitrile, there's no way that they're getting 200 milligrams of stuff. However, it's also an interesting and convenient number here. So they mix nitric acid with acetic anhydride and they stir it to a reflux. Now you would have to stir something really hard to make it reflux. Like I'm talking like a blender and for a while, you know, sometimes blenders get hot, but man, stirred to a reflux, that's, that's another level of hot. Okay, so they get their product again, 37% yield. They're making it sound low so that no one's likely to reproduce it. You can see that they have the same thing that hurts here, you know, 300 hertz, it hurts a lot. They then uh, take their product from this reaction, uh, which is 100 milligrams, and they have exactly half a millimole, which is interesting. They also use 50 milligrams of potassium carbonate, convenient. Um, and yeah, so they just pick very nice clean numbers. They then uh, just concentrate this off. They use an interesting solvent that I haven't heard of before called benzene. I don't know what benzene is. I've worked with benzene, but that's different. And they once again happen to get 37% yield of their product. Okay, so same thing, weird carbon NMR, whatever. So uh, they let us know that for these compounds, they were determined to determine. So that, that was like another useful, interesting thing. But let's go down a bit. So let's maybe let's look at the NMRs. And then we'll come back and look at this section in a minute. So here in their NMR, this looks like an NMR of something like a steroid. Now, uh, there's some issues here. So here, if we look at their uh, molecular ion peak, they say for this product that they get a mass of 352.47. And so an M over Z is the exact mass that they would see by GCMS. Now, when you weigh out a reagent, you don't have a single type of molecule. You have isotopes of deuterium and like carbon-13 throughout the molecule. And so the average molecular weight of the molecule will be greater than the ab than the um, exact mass for the for on average what the molecule will have. And so here in this case, if all of the carbons were carbon-12 and all of the hydrogens were hydrogen-1, no, no deuterium, no carbon-13, the exact mass would be 352.22 or 352.21 if your spectrometer is a little bit off. And so here they report that the mass is 352.47, which lo and behold is the molecular weight. And so that's an average of the mass of all of the different ones with and without carbon-13, with and without deuterium. And so they clearly don't understand how mass spec works. So that's a little bit disappointing, but you can see it, you know, further supports our case that this is probably a bogus article. So let's go back up to here. So they say that they're looking at their biological activity and they say there are several reports to synthesis of spiroderivatives which use some reagents such as thiophene and chlorosuccinamide sulfur derivative iodobenzene diacetate, iron trichloride. This doesn't add anything to the paper. It, it's pretty useless to say what reagents were involved in the synthesis of some random compounds, which are spiro derivatives. Like that's, it's just not, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything here. Like, it's just like a, a fun fact, except it's not fun. I'm not having fun. Hopefully you're having fun though. And so here they say that they were, they uh, prepared derivative one, uh, or they prepare compound two using estradiol and nitrile. Which one? They don't let us know, but I think they mean acetonitrile. And so here you can see this interesting reaction where they go from a secondary alcohol to this weird four-membered ring that we were talking about earlier. And they also somehow displace the OH of uh, the phenol derivative, put a nitrogen on there, which is very, very odd, very, very strange. Okay, so here they give us some really special mechanisms. 
So here, like, remember that all they did is they reflux this in acetonitrile. They didn't do some crazy harsh conditions. And so they, they show the phenol is instead it's deprotonated enolate form. Uh, okay. And then acetonitrile somehow forms an illid, which uh, then has like a carbon going into the plane of the page because I guess they didn't know how to draw like the dot 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 symbol. They show that attacking the carbonyl. I don't know why they had to put the negative charge there because they have like negative attacking something that has a negative charge. So that's a little bit concerning. Then the nitrogen disappears uh, and the positive charge in the alpha position attacks this oxygen. They form a four membered ring and then they have somehow electrons collapse down, open this back up, and then get protonated, but they don't draw it as the amide. They draw it as this weird, like, enol form of an amide. Okay, but my mechanism that I really am uh, interested in is this one here, where they show the secondary alcohol loses a proton, uh, converts to the ketone, and somehow that's an equilibrium. That, that's some special type of chemistry that I'm not familiar with. I've never seen that type of reaction spontaneously happen on its own before. They then have this uh, interesting nitrile illid again with another methyl group going into the plate of the page to attack at the carbonyl. Um, they then stop labeling the C and the positive charge attacks the negative charge. This is something you never see in chemistry. We always follow the movement of electrons, but here you can see the positive charge is attacking the negative charge. And they say that this is a stable product. So this is kind of interesting. Here I didn't even mention this, like the fact that we lose the phenol and have this weird rearrangement, but you know. It's like, a, it's like someone had a nightmare about chemistry, and this is what they saw. Okay, so let's continue. So uh, we talked about the ion. So here they say that they use nitric acid and acetic acid. Uh, but the problem here is if we go back up for the nitration step, they didn't use acetic acid. They actually said they used acetic anhydride, except they didn't know what acetic anhydride was called in English, so they called it anhydride acetic. Close enough. But that's different than acetic acid. So this is another misleading statement from the authors. Um, here they also say that an azeet derivative was prepared via intramolecular reaction by displacement of nitro group in mild conditions. So they said that in figure one, a nitro group was displaced, except they didn't spell that right. They said displa pl displazement, and uh, they get an azeet derivative, except they don't get an azeet derivative. Here they get an oxazole. So the azeet that they were talking about was this weird oxazeet thing that they have over here, but that's actually not what they form when they do the displacement of the nitro. So once again, we have another concerning remark from the authors. Okay. So let's, I think, I think it's time to move on from that. Okay. So here we have a, a very useful remark. There are some reports which indicate that some steroid derivatives can exert changes in the perfusion pressure in vitro. I don't know what that means. Here they also uh, give us another remark. Analyzing these results, other studies were, carry, were carried out. Okay, whatever. Is there anything else here that we need to cover that I haven't covered already? I think, I think we're good. Okay, so there's just a couple last remarks just to wrap up this paper. Okay, so basically, uh, I think this line is one of my favorite ones in the whole paper. There's a couple really funny things left. Since several years ago, some theoretical models have been used to predict the interaction of some drugs with proteins or enzymes. Yes, since several years ago, people have looked at what drugs do to proteins or enzymes. Okay, so the last thing that they say here is that these values were determinate and uh, analyzing these data in this study, a theoretical ass was carried out. Now, I have never carried out a theoretical ass. Please comment down below if you've ever carried out a theoretical ass. I'd be curious to know. Um, here they say that the energy of binding was deter determinate. determinate. Uh, the results showed that there are differences in the thermodynamic parameters of compound four compared to quinalizarin. Um, I don't know, even know what that means. Differences in thermodynamic parameters. That's a very confusing sentence. Here they also say, in this study, a facile synthesis of new steroid oxazole 1, 2 prime, 1, 3 oxazete derivative is reported. I don't know if this is facile because uh, the NMR data that they had was pretty bad. Yeah, actually, we should go back up and talk about the NMR data one more time, just right at the end of this. Um, it is important to mention that the experimental results are supported by the experimental data obtained. I would hope 
that if you uh, had results that your data would support them. So the last thing I'm going to say here is if we look at their NMRs, now that's a terrible NMR. This looks like an NMR of just crap. Like this doesn't look like a steroid derivative. This just looks like crap. Okay, so the things I was going to mention that I didn't mention. Here it says they have DMSO, um, but it says that the solvent that they use is CDCL3. They don't have a CDCL3 peak. If that tiny little peak there and there are aromatic protons, then it doesn't explain where the CDCL3 should be. Um, they also don't have a deuterated DCM peak, so that's like a little bit concerning. Um, okay, so let's go up a little bit. Here, this is the previous compound, which again, this is a not even an NMR of anything real. This is just junk, right? There's there's nothing here. You, you could not report this to any journal and be taken seriously. Okay, here they also use a solvent I've never heard of called chloroform D6. That's a unique one. I've never come across chloroform D6 before. Um, and uh, yeah, again, we don't really see a proper chloroform peak. We do see a big peak that looks like it could be water or something, but it's not totally clear. Okay, so uh, last but not least, their very first spectrum, the one spectrum that looks like it might be a steroid derivative, they uh, say they do it in DMSO D6, and uh, okay, that's fine, but right here it says it's been done in deuterated chloroform. So hopefully this has been an entertaining video. If you'd like me to do more videos in the toxic series, please comment down below. It would really help out this channel if you left a like and subscribed. And I hope you have a great day.